Yorgos Lanthimos is one of my favorite directors working today. He's probably in my personal top three. He's just a real goofball. That's what I love about him. He has mastered the art of deadpan dramedies. I hope she dies right away. He has gotten some amazing performances out of great talent. Look at me! Look at me! How dare you! Close your eyes! And he has really broken through in the American circles now. I love his Greek films, I love his American films, I love his films. He was one of my first directors that got me super into film. I started recommending them to my family and my friends and I started to realize that was a terrible idea. He's not for everybody, but he sure is for me. I love the guy. I'm glad he's getting his flowers in the last few years. I'm gonna do a short introduction to Yorgos Lanthimos, then I'm gonna go ahead and rank all of his movies. This video took me a long time, like almost a year of work, so it's a miracle this is even being made. Trust me. Now let's get to who Yorgos Lanthimos is. My favorite piece of trivia is that Yorgos Lanthimos was a hooper back in the day. Trust me, I tried really hard to find his stats. Really hard. His films are mesmerizing, especially towards the latter half of his career. Having both English and non-English speaking films under his belt, he has tackled some of the most outlandish premises that don't usually escape a pitch room. Now have you thought of what animal you'd like to be if you end up alone? Yes, a lobster. Imagine walking into a studio and going, I want to make a film where single people get turned into animals. Or, I want to make a film where your father miseducates his children on purpose and treats them like dogs. To me, I know their films are nothing alike, but I compare him to a Lars von Trier without all the controversy. My unproblematic king. I understand Hitler. Yorgos demands discussion and rewatches with all of his films, and that is one of the most attractive traits to me when watching a film. If I were in your shoes, I would not be ogling the naked woman, but the horse. I'm sure that horse was once a weak and cowardly man just like you. I want to be watching as many profound films as I can, as I believe the medium of film is that special. As of recent, he has been adapting scripts instead of writing them, and has demonstrated he can be a profound writer and put other works that aren't his on the big screen, while still adding to the source material. I fully recommend his short films as well, but I will not be discussing them here. Let's start the list. You don't have to get every single movie Yorgos Lanthimos does. I did not get this one. I promise you, I tried really, really hard. I watched it twice over. I still have nothing to take away from it. These videos always start with a film that I just quote, don't get. I have no connection to this movie, but if you clicked on this video, chances are you like Yorgos and should probably give it a try. It's about actors starting a business where they help clients through the grieving process by portraying the dead loved ones. I have no unique analysis here, and I'm not trying to Google interpretations and lay them out as my own. I never told you I was smart, man. This film is vaguely about gender, performance, and yeah, even here I'm struggling. Let's move on to the ones we all came to see. One of the more unique entries in his filmography. This is a film based upon letters that turned into a script more than 20 years ago by Deborah Davis. It was hard to pitch a film in the 90s with three leading women with a gay angle is what Deborah Davis said. I am glad of all people to have a chance to adapt this screenplay, it's your ghost. I know this is coming pretty low on the list, but the rest of the movies here are all about 8 through 10 out of 10s. I love all these movies remaining. Let's talk technicals first. I believe this is his best looking film. People have compared it to Barry Lyndon due to the setting and the natural lighting, and yeah, Barry Lyndon is a pretty gorgeous film to be compared to. Roll that 21 Savage montage. How many lawyers you got? A lot. Okay, that's enough. Yorgos is no stranger to wide and lonely shot composition, but this one takes the absolute cake. Every room, every hallway, every opportunity Yorgos gets to demonstrate how small these people are, and how alone these people are, and how depressed this queen is. This may be his most stylish film visually, which I love him doing when it's not his script. It's like he still finds a way to make it his own work in a very loud way. This film is definitely not like the rest of his filmography. Even the dialogue style is different in this film since this is a period piece. Sometimes a lady likes to have some fun. The same type of dark humor is present, but it's not as deadpan as previously. When I view this movie, I stop trying to interpret as much as other people do. To me, it's just presented as a story with loose thematic beats. The main theme of this film being love. Fundamentally, this is about class and love. Real and false love. Emma Stone's character, Abigail, is the false type 
But given the perspective of a poor woman that needs to finesse a bit to upgrade to just decent quality of living, she describes her past life and yeah, you can take a guess or two what that involves for a woman in the early 18th century. Abigail's upfront about her sacrificing morality for a better quality of life. She does all these little things to become buddy-buddy with the queen, playing with her rabbits for example. She's just an opportunist that has no real feelings towards the queen, just views the situationship for class mobility. The other woman played by Rachel Weiss, Sarah, represents true honest love and and I mean brutally honest. She is downright cruel at times to the Queen, but it is always with the right intentions. Do you really think you can meet the Russian delegation looking like that? No. Sarah is trying to be the right hand to the Queen and maintain this position, but also really loves her. The character represents what love actually is, brutally honest and unconditionally caring about their partner. Sarah wants the queen to have her best life and be happy and be powerful. It's never even hinted towards this love being with any motive of retaining power. It is always demonstrated that her motives are love and nothing else. Eventually, Emma Stone's character succeeds, and you see fairly quickly that she is utilizing her status to have a better and lazier quality of life. She is not the most reliable right hand to the queen that needs advice. She misses Sarah and turns into a bit of a tragic ending for Abigail. The final shot is probably one of my favorites, get it, in his filmography. Blending Abigail with the rabbits as she is kneeling to the queen's side, as in, in the end, it's a bit tragic. Abigail is now married, which she only really did to move her status, and is just another rabbit in the queen's depressing life. The rabbit symbolizing all of her dead children that she explains to us. I lost some 17 children. Some were born as blood. Some without breath and someone with me for a very brief time. Olivia Colman's performance in this film is my favorite of hers in her filmography. She embodies such a depressing, powerful figure in this film, and I love how she has all these time bomb moments throughout the film. Did you just look at me? Did you? Look at me! Look at me! How dare you! Close your eyes! Adds a bit of humorous suspense to every scene she is in. An excellent departure from Yorgo's typical shtick. Dare I say this is his most grounded film? Hear me out. I understand Yorgos and grounded do not belong in the same sentence. Of all of his films, they typically take place in a bit of an extreme setting. The world of this film is fairly normal. We are in Cincinnati, for Christ's sake. How more boring could we get? Y'all's chili is ass. Colin Farrell plays Stephen, a heart surgeon who operates on a young boy's father and passes away during surgery. The young boy, played by Barry Keoghan, displays godlike powers to make his family become ill and is requesting a sacrifice from his family to stop the sickness dead in its tracks. His father being the sacred deer. That's where I want to start with this. I'd like to explore what the killing of a sacred deer comes from and a couple themes like humanity and reputation. Before we get into those themes, I want to highlight the way this film is shot. This entire film, Yorgos is adding this eerie element by framing these characters in a unique manner. He always makes characters seem so small in the world they're living in. In this film specifically, it is used to add to the commentary about humanity, but I'll dig into that later. He has a lot of shots of where we're just following characters and it's not smooth at all. It's like we're walking right behind them, comboed with this frightening score. He's making the story a lot more thrilling just off that alone. Lots of slow zooms, entering rooms. This film is shot like a horror movie at times. Yorgos also chooses to shoot from high up, and if you film student buffs know what that usually means, it means he's trying to make the characters seem small. This film likes to make commentary about humanity and God. Steven may play the role of God, or that is what he thinks at least. He is a heart surgeon. Depending on his status, he can save or kill lives, and you know, besides male practice suits, he is mostly met without consequence. That's why I believe this film loves to focus on Steven's hands. You have lovely hands. Thank you. Oh. What the fuck? The start of this film is him taking off bloody gloves, stating loudly and early in this film, there is blood on his hands, and he is able to get rid of this blood and keep his reputation clean. Steven tries to remedy this by having lunches with the young boy to wipe himself of any guilt, but it's not going to work. He also represents the perfect man in a nuclear family. The conversations this family have are so utterly boring, and that's by design. Have you eaten? Yes. How you doing, Peter? You don't have to take the dog for a walk. I took her out already. We got back a little while ago. Okay. Stephen has a very successful job, kids, a beautiful wife, and has not faced the consequences of his actions. It is revealed that he did not perform surgery well that day, most likely because he was off the yak. It is no mistake they make Martin come from a poor family, and this is his way to even the playing field. 
Let's talk about what myth this film is based upon. There is a myth about a King Agamemnon. Hope I got that close enough. Trying to sail to Troy, but dumbass Agamemnon killed a sacred deer and boasted that he was a better hunter than the literal goddess of hunt, Artemis. Artemis controlled the winds and said, sacrifice your daughter and I'll calm the winds to let you set sail. Eventually caving, but it differs from different sources. Barry Keoghan's character being Artemis and Colin being the king. Yorgos does make a key difference in swapping who died Dies, but I love how he adds to this tale with commentary about a mortal meeting a god, regardless of status, and serves as a great cautionary tale. One last thing I want to highlight, I think this was the first film I ever saw Barry Keoghan in. He's got it, man. I'm not gonna call him ugly because he's not, but he looks so damn unique and this gives him opportunities to play really eccentric characters. He gives me the creeps in movies and movies like Banshees demonstrates how great of an actor he truly can be. Oh, uh, there goes that dream. He's got the ick factor, but like, you know, like in a good way. Yorgos Lanthimos was on Barry Keoghan before all of y'all were standing him, okay? He knew the vision. I love when I watch movies and every single time I watch it, it gets even better. I've watched this movie like seven or eight times now and it's gotten better every single time. The movie that put Yorgos on the map. I rewatched this for the first time in about seven years, and man did I enjoy this so much more than I remembered. Dogtooth is a film where parents closet their kids and with the intent of teaching them everything wrong. For example, Mama, borrow na ako to telephone. Para kalo. Efkaristo. Now after watching all of his films, this one really does stick out. This is the only world where you kind of learn why they are doing the things they are doing and why they are acting this way. We have scenes with the dad at work where he does something that isn't entirely too common in Yorgos films. He talks with nuance and outright lies. Most Yorgos characters are very straightforward, very blunt, very confident with what they're saying, and they speak without the idea of social norms. Can I come to your room sometime for a chat? I could give you a blowjob. Or you could just fuck me. I always swallow after fellatio and I've got absolutely no problem with anal sex if that's your thing. This is why I can suggest this film as maybe an introduction to the Yorgos world. I get it, it's not for everyone by any means. I've had plenty of whiffs when recommending movies and most of those whiffs are when I recommend any film by Yorgos. So why do I love this film so much? Well, the interpretations I get from this film go a long way. In order to get like a 9 or a 10 on my arbitrary scale, a film needs to have deeper beneath the surface meaning that requires maybe a few rewatches to interpret. Let's start with my leading theory on this film. And it may sound like a stretch, but I feel like I can defend this well. I don't want y'all to get mad at me, but I feel like this movie is an allegory for fascism. I think it's about fascism. I swear I can explain. The family controls information, they require extreme obedience from their kids and face violent consequences when they are caught disobeying. The parents preach law and order and have their punishment system. The parents are trying to get their kids to not think and to do whatever they want without hesitation. Sounds like loyalty requested from fascist leaders. This is also echoed when we watch the father converse with a dog trainer. A not very subtle moment for the film, but he talks about how the dogs need to never question a command, which completely mirrors his relationship he wants to have with his kids. Later making his kids bark like dogs to take that idea full circle. They bark without questioning their leader. And it's told to them that it is for defending themselves against the beast. Fascism requires fear against an enemy that typically is not an enemy. I believe at times, Yorgos is also trying to poke fun using absurdism to make fun of the fascists. The way they try to explain things when they are in a pickle, when they are caught not being truthful, they somehow convince their kids that they have a brother on the other side of the fence. And it's hinted towards how that was a band-aid solution for another problem that came up. They teach their kids that cats are rabid beasts and solves a band-aid issue with another band-aid solution, showing us that total and utter control of information and actions is pretty difficult. They also create ways to control their people like the mom pretending to be pregnant to get their kids to act properly. It is later revealed that in in order to leave the house, your dog tooth must fall out. Well, these kids are in their mid-twenties. I got news for you. That tooth ain't coming out soon. I think the funniest part of this movie would have to be when he tells his kids that their granddad is Frank Sinatra. Yorgos has a lot to say about sex in this film. The children are around their mid-twenties and have a very warped idea around sex that is on purpose by the parents. Throughout the film, the father pays this woman to come in and have sex with his son. From the start, the idea of sex in this film is exclusively transactional. There are no feelings associated. Sure, it feels good to the man, but later in the film, the sisters are always interested by the quote, spot that feels good, and only view it as a transaction still. I'm going to give you a gift. What a gift. A gift. 
you give and receive. The children are just so repressed that once the visitor is viewed as a threat, the father makes the sisters have sex with their brother with no objection. Why would they object? They're so confused by why most people would object to such a demand. The father knows that the man is going to have sexual urges as he's like a 25 year old dude. He's gonna want some. The father uses it as a way to control him because as we all know, men do stupid things when they're dealing with sexual urges and raw emotions. One last thing I want to talk about is the more obvious interpretation to get from this film. It's pretty much a direct parallel with Plato's allegory of the cave. A group of people chained to a wall, facing a blank wall as they watch shadows move projected by the fire. They're living in a different world than everyone else and this is all they know. These people don't want to leave the cave. This is the life they know and don't know of any any higher quality of life. Kind of the same point Lars von Trier tries to make in Manderley about slavery. Even if the children escape the false reality they are trapped in, they wouldn't survive. Why would they want to leave anyways? It's the only life they know. The sister only wants to leave when she is directly exposed to the outside world in the way of watching Flashdance and Rocky. That's another point Yorgos makes in this film, as he doesn't let them consume media as fascists usually view media as a way to allow citizens to critically think about topics. The one daughter escapes at the end of the film into the trunk of her father's car. Most people People agree that she probably just dies, but I tend to side with the, well, it doesn't matter if she dies anyways. Even if she finds this whole new world where everything she has ever been taught is a lie, she's not going to be able to adapt. She's not going to be able to come and rescue her brother and sister. She would come back talking crazy to them, just like the allegory where the escaper comes back and is blinded from the exposure of the sun that the prisoner was not used to. The people in the cave believe the outside will harm them if they escape too. When she comes back, there is no happy day where she saves the family. Great film and gets better with every single rewatch. Relationships are trivial social constructs, am I right guys? This is his English debut, and he took a bit of a gap from this in Alps. Four years is a lot of time for a movie, and this is why I believe this is his best script to date. The Lobster is a film where single people are discriminated against, and the main character David, played by Colin Farrell, must find a partner within 45 days, or the hotel he is staying at will turn him into an animal of his choice. What must be stated early about this universe is how it uses a hyperbolic world to make points and statements about relationships. Some general ideas that we will explore further include selfishness, predictability of relationships, and how not unique they truly are, tribalism against single and coupled people, and how we lie and play up to a potential partner's interest. Let's get into this here. I absolutely love the hook of this film. It's a great way to start a dark comedy because it's pretty funny, right? Right away in this film, Yorgos is showing us this is a dark, depressing world. It's a lonely world, and the way he shows us this is with all these wide shots. Man, they're beautiful. The world Yorgos created here is used to make statements about relationships and poke fun at them. I believe this and The Favorite are his funniest films to date. Sexual preference? Women. However, I, I had one homosexual experience in the past in college. Is there a Bisexual option available? No, sir. This option is no longer available since about last summer due to several operational problems. The way he comments on how trivial relationships are are constantly hilarious, too. I'm sorry, darling. They had such a huge variety of pain relief ointment. I bought you this one. I hope it's the one you were looking for. That's wonderful, dear. Couples in this universe must have something in common or else. So much so that when David finds a fellow loner that he falls in love with, they're compatible once they find out they're both nearsighted. And this is the tribe that rejects the hotel's theories. In the same world, when she becomes blinded, the world views them as not compatible. Even in the loner society where flirting is strictly forbidden. Any romantic or sexual relations between loners are not permitted, and any such acts are punished. Is that clear? The world created also shows jealousy in a bit of a profound way. Once David has fallen in love, he harasses and kind of assaults another man in the camp just to make sure he isn't nearsighted as well, so he can't steal the potential partner. The couples and the loners both have their own extreme rules and fundamentally reject each other's worlds. Yet, the loners depicted in this film very quietly just want to be in a couple. I feel confident in saying that because the leader, played by Leia Seydoux, separates the couple when making out even though it adds to the story and realism they are portraying on the outside world. Stop it! That's enough. Show my parents some respect. They are playing you music. 
This seems to be mostly due to jealousy. She wouldn't be this emotional about this if it wasn't a jealousy thing. Even with the loners rejecting the hotel society, they still view a common interest as an essential tenet of a relationship. The best scene in this film to me would be when the loners tie up the owners of the hotel and they make the man decide between himself and her. A scene that I believe best represents one of the core beliefs of this film. Humans are all selfish and self-serving. The loners are a bit more outright with this belief as displayed by them digging their own graves. Reminding us a few times that no one else will do it for you. When push comes to shove in the relationship, like being tied up by psychos, the husband chooses without hesitation to kill his wife instead of himself. When push came to shove, all of that love is out the window and you fend for yourself. The loner leader blinds David's new girlfriend to block them from being compatible. When she's screaming in pain and agony, she says this. Why did you have to blind me? You could have blinded him. The ending of this film poses the same question, really. He could blind himself and put his new girlfriend in front of himself, or he could just lie forever and say he's blind, she'll never know. Lovely by Yorgos to leave it ambiguous, but my interpretation would be he probably doesn't end up doing it. Another topic I want to quickly discuss is the limping man played by Paddington faking the nosebleeds. How different is this from seeming more interested in certain topics for a potential partner? Hypothetically, if a man went vegan and acted like he was super into veganism for a woman, I may or may have not done that. Is it that different than faking nosebleeds? It's just a fun criticism of relationships Yorgos has, but yeah, awesome film depicting both sides as a bit tribalistic and trivial. I think this is the movie that makes me enjoy one Yorgos is writing a bit more than he's adapting. Spectacular stuff. I have no idea why I tried to make this video before Poor Things came out, even though I knew it was coming out within like, you know, a few months. I have been waiting so long for this. This is his magnum opus to me. It's where the world of Yorgos Lanthimos most makes sense. All of these films I have talked about include a few specific Yorgo-isms. One of the main ones is the world that the movie takes place in. His films are always absurd and have a heightened reality. Another aspect to the world he creates inside of his films would be how everyone accepts this is how life is. Poor Things is truly the most Yorgos movie he has made. Quick plot synopsis. Poor Things is about a pregnant woman named Bella Baxter that throws herself off a bridge. The crazy doctor decides to put her baby's brain in the dead Bella Baxter's head. And boom, he has created Lady Frankenstein. Let's start with the cast. Emma Stone is really coming into her own now. The roles that she decides to take on now are all so fun. I've been watching The Curse on Showtime and she is insane in that. Please. He's mom. Oh, oh, oh. oh yeah, you're so sweet. When talking about an actor or an actress's performance, I like to think about what challenges they had to face. One thing you can start out with would be the language and fluency of the role. She talks about how Poor Things was filmed out of order. This would make shooting very complex because she has to be able to turn on Emma Stone, an infant Bella Baxter, and an older, wiser Bella Baxter that is a well-read woman, all within the same day. Oh. I got a lot of flack online for saying that Marvel has been hiding him, so let's briefly talk about that. I am aware Mark Ruffalo is one of our greatest working actors. Marvel, during their miracle run, probably took a lot of time out of his schedule. He probably wasn't able to take as many cool-ass roles like this, okay? All I'm trying to say. He has even admitted to never taking roles like this because it was too out of type for him. With especially what the general public expects from him now. It sounds like he will be working on a lot more artsy stuff now which is a huge plus because this man is hilarious in this. The deliveries alone from Mark Ruffalo are the funniest points of the film. Two actors I want to discuss briefly would be Christopher Abbott and Rami Youssef. It's an on the count of three reunion. Defoe was fantastic by the way and he elicits a lot of emotion from the viewer, but these two stole the show for me in smaller roles. Abbott completely hijacks 20 minutes of this movie in the third act and becomes so haunting. I had no idea he was in this film and when I heard his voice and witnessed his performance, everything was heightened. I don't feel like nearly enough people are talking about his performance. Rami is a star, he has awesome stand up by the way. His television show is also a masterpiece and this is his first film. I have no idea how your first film is working with Yorgos Lanthimos but man he has the funniest line delivery of the entire film. Let's talk about some of the technicals, the production design was spectacular there is little to no CG. The backgrounds were essentially just large ass paintings. The locations are very Victorian and gorgeous. The locations also exist in its own world only. It is a great example of world building. The score is one of my favorites of the last decade. It will not get the flowers it deserves. 
The cameras are super technical in this film. I love the use of 16mm lens on 35mm cameras to get the vignette. It makes us a spectator in the beauty. Robbie Ryan is also back with the fisheye lens. He is truly one of the best cinematographers working today. Let's talk about what this film even means. There are a lot of surface level takes from this film, like you could say very plainly, this is the woman's experience. But that feels like a disservice to everything that has been put down here. It's an exploration of truth. It's an exploration of happiness. She is learning from scratch why people do the things they do, how to benefit from people's desires to fulfill her own desires, and brings us a new lens to life. A good film like this is not trying to tell you anything, it's trying to raise more questions. At the end of this movie, I felt happy to be alive. I know that sounds really corny, but I was so giddy walking out of this movie. Most of the time, it raises questions that stupid people on Twitter believe it's about how women should be just hookers and they'll be happy. Really, media literacy is really dead. The third act is my favorite as we can discover the circumstances that led to her ending her life. It really drives home the theme that your own self-discovery and self-interest should be the most important thing in your life. If you want to truly find happiness, you have to take risks and discover what you want in life. It challenges the idea of being tied down to a partner and becoming that partner. Everybody knows somebody that got into a relationship and became the other partner. The ending backs up this claim as the man she ends up with wants Bella to be herself. If you are choosing partners, one of the most essential behaviors they must allow is self-growth, self-discovery, and just allowing them to be themselves. The doctor brings her back to life and decides to shelter her when in reality, if he wanted her to grow as a human, she needs to see the world. It is truly a marvel to look at. There's a lot more to dissect out of this film, but that's just not what I do here. It will be one of the most interesting films you ever watch if you have not watched it yet, and I hope it wins Best Picture somehow. I really do. And that's the list. Truly one of my favorite movies of the last decade. Joros Lanthimos is definitely one of my favorite directors. He's given us a lot of movies to work with. I love that freak. He's got a movie coming out with Emma Stone in the near future. Emma Stone's got the sauce, man. She's great in The Curse. She's great in all these Yorgos Lanthimos movies. She is a talent to be reckoned with. What is your favorite Yorgos Lanthimos movie? I definitely think mine is going to be Poor Things for a really long time. I'll see y'all later.